Hi, the audio on this one is below my quite middling standards, but you're just going to put up with it. Let's talk authorship in music. I mean, let me talk authorship in music. Allow me some very broad descriptors for a paragraph, because this is the setup and not the bit that I'm meant to be actually accurate about. Popular song really took off in the 1950s when rock and roll music reached the mainstream, the white stream. And when Sam Phillips said, If I could find a white boy who can sing like a black man, I'd make me a million dollars. And then Elvis was a thing. Before this, the more likely format for musicians was playing the standards. Like a jazz band, but with it being about replication more than creativity. Entirely rewarding familiarity. Rock and roll musicians would be hardy, roughly ready to perform something they've never even heard due to the grammar of its format. I learned that from Back to the Future. Try telling a contemporary band to play something that's not theirs. It's just not how it works now, due to the way that the talent has diversified. In general, a contemporary band or musician is only ready to play the things they play, because that's what their talent is. Now we have these myriad micro-genres. Back to the Back to the Future, Chuck Berry is a good citation. He wrote most of his own identical material. But the standard of pop music consisting of original songs performed by their writers really cemented in the mainstream when it cemented in the white stream in the age of the Beatles. Before that, a rock band with these smiling boys in suits who could do the songs, you know. The Beatles were that, but then there were more than that, and various contemporaries made an equivalent journey. Maybe some of them beat them to it in ways I might bother to research sometime. <laughs> it's just the Beatles are the most prominent and influential and accessible example in this universe. By the end of the 1960s, originals outnumbered covers. The one cover song on each album was a little indulgence. This made an album a creative product more than a recitative one, and the occasional covers album was just a cute little sideshow with a low chance of being any good. Since this standard of songwriting was set, there have been waves of its exploitation. Where pretty faces mime to the songs, where pop is churned out of a factory, where Swedish Sven galleys craft number ones, numbers one, for the highest bidder, where writer's rooms design the next few months of chart hits in advance, in cahoots with the marketing team, chart-oriented pop does what it's supposed to. CAPITALISM! We're now in a wave of more honest authorship in pop, but both approaches are still happening. The progress of culture involves an exponential spread rather than replacement. The great exponential spread. I shouldn't do Nazi references. I specifically celebrate songwriting because that's how the songs got there, the one part that we cannot swap out. Some performers bring new strengths to other people's material, but few, if any, who are not the writers bring anything that literally no one else could. It's the composition rather than the recitation that interests me. This kind of stuff is where you get Damon Albarn ignorantly dissing Taylor Swift because she has less help writing songs than he does. But sometimes the recitation is the composition. Consider the surnames in brackets after a song title, and consider if that one dude really wrote all of the drum and bass parts that other band members play. Honestly, in some cases that's a yes, but in many it's a no. This vindicates the drummer and bassist as creditable writers, maybe not equal contributors, but they've invented how some of this song sounds, some of its composition, and yet they're only credited with performance. Unless the bass parts are just the root notes and the drum part is just basic backbeat, which will happen, is faceted. If you could remove their uncredited influence on the composition, is the song still the song? Often yes, if it's on the front person's, like, acoustic guitar and voice, it's hard to argue that that status doesn't count as a full song. 
This suggests that creative attribution should be on at least two tiers, the song's foundation and its construction. I think the system of attribution we have recognizes this, but considers drummers and bassists acceptable casualties. They're like the women of rock. In composing my music, I've wisely sidestepped this whole debacle by having no friends. It's strange that we publicly credit songs to their most known performers rather than their writers. That's not how authorship of anything else works. I've been on session about this attribution when doing cover songs, because really I'm covering the writer, not the best known performer. How about this Ash B-side that they introduced as a cover when I saw them live a couple of weeks ago? It was written by someone who's not in the band, so yeah, that's a cover. Except no recording of the song by its original writer is publicly available, so everyone who's not involved in the writing and covering of the song thinks of it as an Ash one. So if that's a cover, then it is to the same extent that everything Elvis did was, or like your classical music performances. The premise underpinning the concept of a cover was developed throughout the 20th century as we got the opportunity to record music and then decide which one was the original version. When Meat Loaf died, everyone called him a genius, and I can't really process how that word applies. Where were these tributes when Jim Steinman died, who wrote every song you think Meat Loaf is a genius for singing? I don't know if that's a misattribution or just a different definition of genius. Maybe people are just consciously buying into the myth of the performer that would explain all the Elvis worship. Meat was a very talented performer, but we generally use the word genius to refer to intellectual or creative brilliance. Look at Mr. Love's politics, and he definitely wasn't very intellectual, and there's just no evidence of his creativity. Text splash. He had to learn his songs by intently studying and mimicking Jim Steinman's demos. And Steinman was arguably a genius, he just lacked the vocal chops of meat. Really, intricacies of this debate are in the world of copyright, intellectual property, lawsuits, royalties, taxes, agents, every songwriter contributor having to set up these one-person companies with whimsical names you can find credited in the album booklets. Fucking boring shit that undermines creativity. I suggest we credit every creative contributor with the transparency that describes their contribution to writing, to performance, and to production. This does already happen, like on Beyonce music, I just like to see it on music that wasn't designed by a corporate cabal. Why do videos make me sweat so much?